Thank you, Hiro, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to share this panel with, um, with Tim and Ricky. Um, so I wanted to talk to you in the time that I have about some of the projects that uh, are underway in New York or some of the proposals for projects that are underway. I, I would presume that most people here have heard about the um, initiatives of the Bloomberg era to uh, the green waterfronts and to install bike lanes and so forth. So I wanted to bring you up to date. As Ricky mentioned, we have a mayor in New York, uh, Bill de Blasio, who has replaced uh, Mayor Bloomberg, and he has some different ideas about what uh, the priorities are in New York. So I would go over a few of them. Um, and they all in some way relate to um, changing the public realm, uh, public space. Um, let me begin by, uh, I'll talk about seven of them, and I'll run through them pretty quickly. Um, the f New York has a population around 8.3 million people, and it's predicted to go up uh, significantly, at least to 9 million people by 2050. And as you know, uh, New York's a very expensive place to live. Uh, I think now the average apartment cost in Manhattan has gone over a million dollars. And you have to remember, of course, that uh, many apartments in Manhattan are in still relatively poor neighborhoods, so those prices go up into the uh, up to over $100 million. And even Brooklyn, the prices of uh, average apartments are now almost $700,000. So New York is largely unaffordable to many of the people who make it run, um, who give it uh, its lifeblood, and uh, who have often been there for... Uh, many generations. So the major initiative of Mayor de Blasio um, is to create more affordable housing. What affordable means is, of course, a complicated question, affordable to whom. Um, and uh, Mayor Bloomberg also tried to create affordable housing. In fact, put aside about 150,000 apartments, uh, either by building new ones or preserving those that already had some uh, affordable guarantees. Um, but that was a Sisyphusian task because essentially many of the affordable apartments, uh, we say in New York rent controlled or rent subsidized apartments, uh, passed out of rent control and became market rate apartments. And so in fact, the city has constantly been losing affordable apartments, the total number. So the goal of this mayor is to build uh, or preserve 200,000 over the next decade, um, build 80,000, preserve 120,000. And that's a complicated task when you don't have a lot of uh, obvious places to do it. You need the land and you need the money. And in New York, we tend to not to build as we used to, as the public, the government building these houses but we basically incentivize private developers by giving them tax breaks in order to have them, as part of the, the uh, incentive, uh, add affordable apartments to their projects. Um, this is another discussion where that's the most efficient way to do it. But um, this requires creating these initiatives in neighborhoods like the one you're looking at here, East New York. This is just about the poorest neighborhood in. Uh, the city, it's in Brooklyn, it's an industrial area, um, it's an area of a lot of uh, public housing projects and a lot of open spaces like you're seeing here, which the city hopes to convert into um, new uh, housing projects. Um, one of the problems with doing it in an area like this, of course, is you are concentrating poverty. Um, because there's really very little market rate apartments, by which I mean there are very few people who will choose to live here uh, and pay a higher price to do so. Um, at least they won't do it for a while. And while the city has been contemplating how to develop areas like this one in East New York, speculators, real estate speculators, have already been buying properties in East New York raising the value of land there and pricing out some of the very poor people whom the new policy is intended to protect. So it's a very complicated situation, but I raise it not just to point out that this is really the major 
uh, land use change in New York uh, at the moment, but also to say that the people in this area, in East New York, are very concerned not just with having more and better housing, in fact, most of them don't really want that, but they want other things. They don't see housing as a neighborhood. They want the things that make a neighborhood. A new library, new parks, better schools. And the question, which in New York has always been a complicated one, is how do we plan neighborhoods in a holistic way to think that we don't just build a house, a new housing project, but we also have to put schools there. We have to think of libraries. We have to think of green and open spaces. We have a very, you might say in English, siloed, separate way of both legislating, governing, and planning these new developments. And here is a good example of a place where East New York needs many things, and not just new housing. But the reason it was chosen is both because it has lots of land and because um, it's actually rather well served by transit. So I want to take you to another um, possible initiative, and here I have a self-interest. I had been looking at areas of the city and talking to people that um, might be interesting to think about for new development that the city was not thinking about. And I met a man uh, named Alex Garvin, a planner in New York City, who some years ago came up with an idea to return a kind of light rail system to the streets of the waterfront of Brooklyn and Queens. And I spent some time working on that idea. It intrigued me a lot. And I came up with a plan of my own, um, based in part on what Alex had done and extrapolating from it. And the city now seems to be thinking of it, and I'll tell you why I'm bringing it up um, in the process. So this is a view of the old streetcar that used to be near the Brooklyn Bridge and went along um, uh, the waterfront there. Brooklyn had one of the most extensive streetcar systems in America. The baseball team called the Dodgers were uh, supposedly named after the people who would dodge or run out of the way of the streetcars in the streets of Brooklyn. Uh, it went out uh, like um, like the streetcars did here in Tokyo, I gather, but even earlier. Um, and uh, the plan would be essentially to restore the streetcar from an even longer path. I'm sorry, this is such a horrible and difficult to read slide, but in essence, a 17-mile stretch that would stretch below where you see it here to an area called Sunset Park, go all the way up the Brooklyn uh, uh, coast, the coast of the East River, um, cross over into Queens and up to the Triborough Bridge through the area of Long Island City and Astoria. Now, this is interesting, and I'll tell you why I think um, the city might now be considering it, why it relates to some of the issues that are on the table in New York. This area includes about 600,000 people. Um, it, it actually crosses over uh, 10 neighborhoods, and as I said, it's about 17 miles, so it's a very long stretch. But almost all of this area has no access to uh, public transit. It's not near subway lines. And it's also, in a certain sense, the new spine, or the potential new spine of New York. Because, in fact, Broadway, uh, where Tim was talking about, is often thought of as the spine of New York, but as development has moved, people have moved to Brooklyn and are moving to Queens, you have new routes, new, we call them sometimes desire lines in parks, the paths people wish to follow. And so, in part, the, the idea here is to try to provide transit, not where people are, but where people want to go, and then to link it with existing transit. And key to this is that these people that I'm describing include some new developments and very wealthy ones in areas that you've heard of like Williamsburg. And so there's a lot of interest on the part of developers in thinking about new transit links to serve their uh, residents. But it also includes about 44,000 people who are in public housing and have never had access to good public transit. And this would create not just new jobs, but cut transit time for them dramatically. So um, 
the other one the thing I'll say about this, and I, we can talk about this later or not if it interests anybody, but I, after this idea was put out there, some developers started to look into it and they discovered, uh, they did some studies and spent rather millions of dollars actually uh, putting this together. And what they found was that if they did this development, it would initiate about $3.7 billion of value in terms of estimated future taxes in rising property values, which would pay for the entire project itself. In essence, it's a project that is based on the notion that development can pay for itself. There would be no government funds, no federal funds anyway, uh, to make this happen. So this is another thing that could um, happen in the city. And I also mention it because it is about uh, reimagining abandoned uh, or disused infrastructure. And now we all know about, um, this is uh, part of the same uh, route. Now we all know about what has happened to the High Line, which is the path you see uh, here. Uh, this is the north end of it, this curving S. Um, it surrounds at this part uh, of the High Line, the top northern part, uh, some, a project called Hudson Yards, a 28-acre project, uh, probably the wealthiest, richest uh, redevelopment project in New York's uh, history. It's mostly um, skyscrapers, um, and uh, there will be 16 of them, about 6 million square feet of commercial space, but also uh, a sort of cultural center, whose uses are not quite clear, about 14 acres of public space. And um, here's the key thing about this development, I think. It covers what you see here. These are the rail yards. So this will all become covered, greened, and also filled with skyscrapers. If you look at this area closely, you'll see at the very top here, this round building. That's Madison Square Garden. Madison Square Garden sits on top of Penn Station, which serves about 600,000 commuters and subway riders a day. Ricky mentioned King's Cross uh, in London. King's Cross similarly was a decrepit uh, and very dangerous um, place that was at the center of a very bad neighborhood. Um, when, King's Cross, when a terrible accident happened, because King's Cross was in a terrible uh, state, there was this effort to rejuvenate King's Cross and St. Pancras next to it and the area, and Ricky talked uh, very, um, vividly about the enormous uh, transformational change. Penn Station is very much like King's Cross. It's a very crucial hub for the city, and it's a dangerous, dirty, and horrible place that serves people very badly in the city. It is essentially, though, the potential heart of this massive redevelopment of the center, the west side of Manhattan. And there are a lot of plans out there right now um, to talk about how this could really transform the city in a way that hasn't happened in at least a century. Um, it would also involve new tunnels, which would come from New Jersey, which are now finally being talked about, and c connect to Penn Station. And maybe the garden could move from there to, say, here or to here somewhere where it would liberate Penn Station that's now buried beneath it. So this is another major project that's under consideration. I'll run through just a few more. This is the new train station, by the way, that's opened at Hudson Yards. It's the first subway station to open in New York in, I don't know, maybe Tim remembers, about 60 years. Um, and it's already been, uh, become a, a huge attraction and it is the essence of the redevelopment project, that it is linked to the transit system. Like the streetcar or almost all the proposals for development in New York, it's based on the notion of access to public transit, not just for convenience, but as a matter of equity and fairness. Now, Tim mentioned what's happening at, at Times Square and all the um, incredible efforts to transform it and uh, some of the recent controversies which Fortunately, he's been able to steer the city away from doing the wrong things. But um, I should just say uh, quickly that the plaza uh, program in the city 
uh, does not only include Times Square, but many, I think, Tim, maybe 70 or so, plazas around the city. And they are, like this one here at Pearl Street in, in uh, Brooklyn, uh, attempts essentially to seize back an area of the street um, that had been used for parking or more or less was disused and turned into exactly what you see. Just paint it, add some benches and some potted plants and turn into a place that people can take over to pedestrianize it. And these have had not universal success, but enormous success throughout the city and are part of what I think is also the other very large issue which this administration is not focused on, but which is key. And that is rethinking the streets completely, not just in terms of pedestrianizing them, but thinking in terms of future driverless cars, and then thinking in terms of how the city can be reclaimed for bikes and to essentially flip the priority away from the car and reclaim these spaces for better use, which is essentially for um, pedestrians and people. I'll quickly just say this reclaiming of space is also crucial to another area that is critical to this administration and relates to where I began, and that is trying to help rethink NYCHA housing. In essence, this is the public housing I spoke of that was built generations ago. Uh, NYCHA stands for New York City Housing Authority. And officially, about 600,000 people live in NYCHA housing. In fact, it's probably closer to a million. So we're talking about much larger than the population of Boston or Washington, D.C. alone lives in this very poor housing. And the effort, essentially, is to rethink ways of financing what is now the bankrupt NYCHA system, but also of reintegrating these NYCHA projects, many of them towers in the park projects. Sorry, let me go back, I meant to the pointer. Tower in the park projects with very bleak spaces around them by infilling, that is adding new developments, uh, commercial, market rate housing, but also community services worked out in collaboration with the residents of these projects in order to recreate the streetscape, to create new pedestrian areas, to create new street fronts and services, and so to reconnect these NYCHA projects to the city, to make them less the ghettos that they had become. Quickly, I'll just say, I went the other day to the Far Rockaways, which is a distant area, uh, uh, on the ocean, which had been very badly damaged by Sandy. This was one of those projects that was very badly damaged, uh, a public housing project um, for about 1,000 residents. And um, a new uh, thing has happened there, which is that it has been reskinned by a developer, it's taken it over, and transformed this project called Ocean Village uh, completely, adding these beautiful new public spaces, um, a new waterfront access, uh, new playgrounds, um, new kitchens and bathrooms for everybody, and a new skin for these buildings. And I can only tell you that it costs $75 million and has had an extraordinary effect. The last two things I'll say, and I'm running out of time, so I don't want to waste too much, um, are projects that you may have heard of. Uh, I, I won, you certainly will, but this one is called The Big U. And it was part of the post-Superstorm uh, Sandy uh, resilience initiatives. Um, this one funded by the federal government. And this plan is headed by Bjarke Ingels, the architect whose firm called Big put together a team. And the proposal is essentially to green and make more resilient, more uh, environmentally um, sound, uh, about 10 miles of lower Manhattan, actually stretching all the way around the southern end of Manhattan, shielding the city from floods and stormwater, improving the public realm, uh, providing new playing fields, markets, gardens, and so on. Um, and it will begin uh, in an area um, on the east side next to public housing projects, where, which have always been cut off from the waterfront by the highway. 
uh, the West, the, the, it was called the FDR. Um, so the project essentially is beginning, as some of these other things I've been talking about, um, begins from an idea of providing better access to people in some of the most underprivileged areas. And about $335 million of federal funding has already been put aside for that. I'll just end now with something you know. Uh, we can talk about this um, at, at length if, if everyone wishes. But since there was so much talk about skyscrapers, um, New York, too, of course, is going through a, a wave of new giant, super slender skyscrapers, uh, very particular to the city. Um, here, along 57th Street, with views of Central Park, are some of these new towers that will rise. Um, into the clouds, about 1,300 feet high, a whole phalanx or rank of them along 57th Street. And um, this one is uh, just about done. It's called 432 Park Avenue. Um, and uh, obviously it's caused a lot of concern among some people. Um, I will just raise one issue with this. Um, New York has always been a city of skyscrapers. Um, and in fact, the buildings along the southern end of Central Park, uh, they were skyscrapers when they first went up. Now they are kind of uh, synonymous with the beauty of Central Park. That's not to defend all these skyscrapers. Some of them are good and some of them are bad. But it occurred to me that one of the issues that in a place like London is discussed but is never discussed in a place like New York is the extent to which the skyline is also the public realm. If someone is going to put up a building that's taller than the Empire State Building, in fact, a lot of them, they're going to change the profile of the city. They're going to change something that is a shared asset in New York. This is done as of right, as we say, meaning the developer can just do it. But I think there is an interesting conversation to be had about how much the city is, is the public realm, I'm sorry, the skyline is the public realm, and how much decisions about what it looks like and what shape it takes should participate in some of the same conversations that happen when we talk about the development of other aspects of the public realm, our parks and our streets. And I think possibly, these new skyscrapers may initiate this conversation. At least maybe we can start it now. But in any case, I think that it's an important one to have because after all, these really determine not just how we live, but who we are. And that's really what the public realm is about. So thank you very much and sorry to run a little over.